what exactly is a dead serious blue water ocean crossing get you there every time sort of sailboat a few things might come to mind you'd want a full keel for sure maybe a cutter rig some high combings to keep you dry the weight and well-mannered behavior so that the crew doesn't get worn out while you're underway maybe throw in some massive tankage for fresh water well thought out sea berths and fiberglass hand laid so thick that teenage boys will try to slide into its dms and for good measure the story should have a good old controversy where one designer steals another designer's boat changes it ever so slightly and then sells it as their own and then maybe another company steals that this week on everything you need to know we're talking about hans christian hey guys happy valentine's day you might be seeing this the day after but uh, i recorded it on valentine's day so it's valentine's day for me and love is definitely in the air and what's more to love than an age-old traditional sailing yacht with lines as beautiful as these sheet lines coiled up next to rita hayworth in 1947. what's more beautiful than a 25,000 pound double ender making a passage or a cutter at full chat with all the cloth up even sitting still in a quiet anchorage, few things in this world are more beautiful or more awe-inspiring than Hans Christian. And what's a good sailboat story without some controversy and tales of theft, but also some tales of passages and millions of miles conquered on all of Earth's oceans? A boat that will truly get you anywhere and turn every head in every anchorage that you'll undoubtedly safely arrive in. That's a rare thing, but not if you own one of these. Okay, first a disclaimer. In the 1950s, as sailboat sales and production sort of started to take off, some entrepreneurial folks saw the opportunity to hire American or British designers to make boats for the West, but set up the manufacturing in Asia to save money, build low and sell high sort of thing. This did work pretty well overall, but it led to some issues. While the Asian manufacturing usually got the glass layups done right, sometimes in this may come as a surprise, but sometimes some of the hardware would be a bit of a knockoff of higher end stuff. Not to say that there was anything wrong with these boats, but if it's cheap, like me, there's probably a reason. That said, there were also issues with the language barrier and the cultural barrier. A design might be made in Annapolis or in Florida, but by the time the build team tooled up to assemble it in, say, Taiwan, Things were changed or misinterpreted at least. Now enter John Edwards, a high school teacher out in California, and he had just such an idea. Design in America, build in Asia. But he wanted to build an extremely heavy displacement, ultimate go anywhere style of boat. So he got a hold of a naval architect by the name of Robert Perry. You may remember Robert Perry's from such designs as the Islander line of boats, some Choi Lee's, the legendary Tiana 37, and about a hundred other successful boat designs. So legendary Robert Perry designs a boat, which would ultimately become the Hans Christian 34, and he hands it over to Hans Christian founder, John Edwards. But before they even built the first 34, things got a little bit weird. The story goes that Hans Christian took Perry's design and basically photocopied it, but two feet longer. This led to some issues because while Perry did essentially design the boat and was due royalty payments, Hans Christian would not pay him for the 36 footer. To make matters worse, Hans Christian also continued to tout the 36 as a Robert Perry design, which it sort of was. But because it sort of wasn't, they wouldn't pay him. The whole thing is shadier than a guy from India calling me and telling me the government is going to arrest me if I don't send him a $200 Walmart gift card. But it didn't end here. The boatyard in Taiwan was a company called Union, and they took the tooling, which they sort of owned in part of the deal, and the molds for the 36, which was just a stolen and blown up photocopied 34, and they released their own boat called the Union 36. So now everyone is ripping everyone off. On top of all this, Hans Christian was also building other boats, listing in-house designers that no one could seem to find or even prove they existed. It was like the Wild West of boat building where you could buy a bottle of sailboat juice that would cure hangover and morning sickness and the plague, but it turned out to just be a bottle of liquid cocaine. 
Lady Case Sailing is brought to you by patrons. People give a couple of bucks an episode to make this whole channel possible. Thank you so much, guys. All was not lost for the original designer, Robert Perry, however. In retaliation for not being paid royalties, he took his considerable skill and everything he learned designing the 34 and photocopied 36 and he decided to design something else for someone else. That's how we got the Tiana 37, which is one of the greatest cruising boats of all time. This is like Dave Mustaine being kicked out of Metallica for being too rock and roll and saying, screw it, joining Megadeth and going on to be rich and famous and having an illustrious career. The Tiana 37 really is that good. Maybe they should have called it the Mustaine. Later, the folks over at Union who were building the 36 under their own name, which was basically a stolen 34, got a hold of the designer, Robert Perry, who is the rightful designer, and they did make good with him. The deal was they could claim the 36 as one of his designs, which inadvertently it sort of was, and it wasn't. In return, they would pay him royalties. But as with all things in this story, that deal fell apart eventually as well. This story is so convoluted and so complicated that multiple versions of the story actually exist, but suffice it to say, this was a common issue in two countries, a world apart, speaking two different languages with two very different cultures, try to build something together. And remember, this is the days before instant communication and endless Zoom calls in our pajamas. Later, the Hans Christian 36 was built by multiple companies, including the original Hans Christian, the Union 36, a Mariner Polaris 36, and the EO 36. However, it's said by many that the original Hans Christian boats are the ones that you want. They're better constructed, better quality, better craftsmanship. So why is the 34 and 36 so special? It's designed to really be a thing of beauty, but also a rock-solid platform to go cruising anywhere your little heart desires. It's a double ender for that traditional vibe, it's cutter rigged for ocean sailing, and it's heavy, very heavy. The original plans and manufacturer spec said it was just over 18,000 pounds, but most owners report a lift weight of over 25,000 pounds. Talk about lying on your dating profile. The boat was typical of Taiwan in the time in that it had an extra thick solid glass hand laid hull, a real teak deck and all wood interior. And you could get one on the cheap too, because labor in Asia at the time was one tenth the cost of labor in the West. Get this, the deck layup, it was five eighths of teak planks, over three eighths of glass, followed by three quarter inches of plywood, and then another three eighths of glass. That is some serious structure. You wouldn't even hear the seals sneaking up on deck to poop everywhere while you slept soundly inside. The hull to deck joint is through bolted for that ocean going strength and rigidity that you need, but then it's also glassed over on the inside for added strength. The main traveler was originally a really heavy solid bronze deal mounted way too far forward for good control or trimming of the mainsail, but most have actually been moved aft now by their owners, so the problem's been largely corrected. Many of the Hans Christian boats have had little problems here and there, however. Small things that don't really hurt the overall quality of the boat, but no less they are a pain. One such problem was reported that the, the guy building one of the boats forgot to drill a weeping hole under one of the stanchions. And over the years, it turned into a leak over the galley, and it took the owner a really long time and a lot of trouble to figure out where the leak was coming from because it was under a stanchion. Sometimes also you would find dissimilar metals. You would find sort of stainless fasteners in the bronze hardware, which is a no-no. And of course, occasionally the builder would source, shall we say, less than authentic hardware. Brands I'm quite sure might have been called Ludmar or Harkeen. Another big issue with the 36 was the leading edge of its full keel. For whatever reason, it was designed with a sort of flat nose shape, which made the boat much slower than it needed to be. A lot of owners uh, call it the cheese wedge keel, uh, but many have actually rectified that issue, constructing out of foam and then going over it with glass to reshape it into something a little bit more pointy on the front end. Downstairs, you get a smaller galley, but fairly accommodating quarter berth to starboard with a nav station and a charting area suitable for ocean passages and life-size charts. Typical of the size of this boat, you get a C-shaped dinette and across from that, you get a single berth where your buddy can sleep when his wife kicks him out again. 
Of course, this boat is littered with bronze opening ports, but the piece de resistance of older traditional yachts like this is always the massive opening skylight. Some call it the butterfly skylight. Just this skylight alone is good enough reason for me to want one of these boats. I need this skylight in my life. Again, the Taiwan issues come to light because rules are different in different places. Most of these boats had an illegal propane T-junction inside. One lead would go to supply the stove and one went to supply a small heater. Each should, of course, have its own line inside the boat and any junctions are completely against code. Also, originally you'd find gate valves on some of the through hulls or knockoff versions of some brand name ball valves that will need to be swapped out. For a 25,000 pound boat with a cheese wedge for a keel, they do sail fair in light conditions. A lot of owners report three to four knots of forward speed on a beam and five knots of wind. But the real reason you'd buy one of these isn't for lake sailing or light wind or weekending. You buy one of these for the ocean. This Hans Christian has been known to average seven to nine knots all day long in the trade winds and reefing won't even cross your mind until you're well over 20 knots apparent. In fact, with the cutter rig, you may not reef at all. There's so many sail configuration options, you may just switch to smaller sails. Owners also report that there is no other boat they'd rather be on when things get scary. They report heaving to in over 30 or 40 knots, and the boat settles in so well and so comfortably that you can go downstairs and cook a meal for the crew or console your buddy who's still sleeping on your couch. Really, there are very few downsides to these boats. If you're built for speed, it very much isn't. You may be the last one to get to the anchorage after a 125 mile day, but you can be absolutely sure it will get you there in comfort and safety. The other really big downside is that they are truly rare. Only a few hundred exist, and of those still sailing, you're going to be very hard pressed to find an owner who actually wants to sell theirs. These are really a thing of beauty and a timeless design, and I would say if you can get one or have one, hang on to it because they are going to be worth a fortune down the road. What you might find instead, if you're looking for one of these, is the baby sister, the Hans Christian 33. Now the 33 wasn't commissioned by founder John Edwards until 1979, so it's a lot more modern than her big sisters. She was intended to replace the 34 in the less than authorized 36. The designer hired to pen the 33 was legendary designer Harwood Ives, and what did he ask for a payment if he agreed to design the 33 foot for Hans Christian? Not cash, not shares in the company. He said if he's going to design the boat, he wants one of them. Right off the production line. That's some confidence. The 33 was a big success for Hans Christian, and though the company changed hands a few times over the years, and manufacturing changed places, um, they kept making the boat in one form or another all the way till 2009. 1979 to 2009, the 33 really deserves its own episode, and this episode's kind of running long. But suffice it to say, in 2009, you could order a brand new Hans Christian 33 for the tidy sum of 297,000 US dollars for a 33 footer. That's how good this boat is. And someone did. The last one reportedly made was shipped to Europe. That's it for this week, guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I will see you guys next week.